I, I don't think Jim J- watching what Jim Channels does is really valuable. The guys kind of had a pretty mediocre track record. Most guys on Wall Street don't respect him that much. I don't think Kamath is very good at investing. He's a pretty smart guy, obviously, but the whole SPAC thing is pretty pretty ugly. Burry's also kind of one of these people that mass market pays attention to way, way more than the actual Wall Street doesn't care about Michael Burry. So I get asked about him every day. So I guess he's some kind of celebrity, but it's not like he runs a big fund or anything. There's there's like 200 people at point seventy two that run more manage more money than Michael Burry. <laughs> He just likes to talk, you know, a lot, which which a lot of Wall Street doesn't like to do. That's uh, why people listen to Michael Burry. If you had people who actually would talk more, then you'd have a lot more interesting people out there. Let's see, Michael Burry annual returns. Looks like he didn't make any money for five years there. But what is this? This isn't even, this is a 13F tracker. This doesn't, this doesn't tell us anything. I mean, his private, uh, private returns. This is 2000. This is a while back. I guess he restarted. What is this, Buryology? you got to be kidding me. 29% Kager. I don't know. I'd be curious what the last five or six years would be. It doesn't appear easy to find. I'm not saying he's a bad fund manager or something like that. I'm just saying like the amount of attention paid to him versus other investors on Wall Street is, is unwarranted. So he had an eight year run. That was an interesting time for managing a hedge fund. And then did he, did he open it back up? Looks like he was short Tesla, which I guess he was wrong about. <laughs> Whoops. So does he have uh, outside money? Oh, he did reopen the fund. Okay, 2013. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know what his returns were in the last five or six years or whatever. There's a lot more interesting people to uh, to follow, but you guys would never have heard of them on Wall Street. Do you want me to tell you about a few of them? Should I do that? I, I can't break my omerta, my oath of silence, and give up some of my uh, secrets. Oh man. Well. Let me look at this. I made this sheet, and this is on my GitHub. So this is by Q3, although Valentine's Day passed, so Q4 is out now. Let's take a look at Citadel. So you got to keep in mind that there are people at Citadel that manage more just working at Citadel. They manage 10 times more than Burry ever has, and they have better track records. Just think about that, right? you got a fund like this. They've got 200, 300 different pods. Right? Um, and those pods are just slivers of capital that traders at Citadel trade. Now, it's not only fundamental stock jocks like Burry or macro jocks or whatever, but it's also people, it's also quantitative investors. So it's a mix of, of different types of investors and different types of strategies. So it's, it's a very diverse pool of investors, which is why they're, they're so successful. Um, you can see that their portfolio includes virtually every stock in the stock market from A to Z. They're either long or short. And you, you could have one portfolio. You could have John that's long one of these stocks, 10X Genomics. And in the same firm, you could have Henry who's, who's short it or long it. You know, they, they take different sides. And so the firm itself is actually not even long or short that stock. You know, it's a very kind of convoluted system, these so-called pod shops. There are, there are kind of four big pod shops. You've got Citadel. Millennium, uh, Baliazny, and Point72. Those are the four big pod shops. You know, at those pod shops, there are people who have track records that you wouldn't believe. Now, a lot of times people say, why don't you start your own fund? Um, I'll give you an example. This guy, Samlin, most people have never heard of. That's somebody that worked at one of those four pod shops. You can go do the research. And he was very, very good, left, and now he has his own hedge fund. But I, I, I think that this person could easily be managing more than they're managing now at their own firm if they stayed at the pot shop they were at. And maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, but at some of these pot shops, they'll pay you 20%. You know, the firm charges its fee to the investors, which is usually one in 20 or two in 20 or something like that. Sometimes it's a little higher. Uh, Citadel has a very weird expense strategy, for example. And the, the idea is, let's say you're, you're a great trader of 
Japanese technology stocks, right? And you're working at one of the four pod shops. Maybe you're working at Millennium. Maybe you're working at Point72. Maybe you're working at Baliazani. Maybe you're working at Citadel. And you're managing $500 million. And you're doing really well. Every year, you're up 30%. You're better than Burry. And every year, let's do the math. Let's call our Japanese trader, what should we call him? Ash. He's managing $500 million. He makes 30% return. So this is Citadel, or I'll just call it Pod, Pod Shop profits, right? And so now the Pod Shop has to decide how much to bonus, bonus this guy. So if they give him 20%, that's $30 million, right? Ash bonus, or really it's like Ash carry, p &L, whatever. And this is often held in some form of offshore entity. So these profits tend to carry forward without taxation, which is another kind of hedge fund secret. Um, so the question for Ash is should he leave or should he stay and start his own firm? So it depends on, on his profit share. So let's say his profit share is 15%. This may be a little more realistic. So he, his bonus is $22 million. So this is his uh, AUM at Podshop. This is his annual return. 30% is very hard to do, by the way. Most of these guys are not doing 30% annual returns. They're doing like 10 or 15% returns. Uh, but you know, last year Citadel made about 30 something percent. So I think maybe some of that was a little leverage, who knows. Um, so anyway, it's still pretty good. Even if, if you make 15%, it's pretty good living. Uh, having said that, you know, you, know uh, you still have to pay off some of your teammates. Maybe that's uh, I don't know, one or two million. So now, if you, if you somehow get that in the U.S. tax structure, you're you're looking at <laughs> all the way down to four million. So so now, if you start start your own fund, there's a lot of risk to doing this, right? First of all, if your skill is as a trader, not as running a business, you'd have to um, do a lot of uh, do a lot of marketing. Somebody's asking about Citadel shares sold yet not purchased. That's just a short sale. So a lot of people are confused by that. When you see shares sold uh, but not yet purchased, that's just something that means that they've shorted a stock, which for a hedge fund is, duh, that's what they do. So that shouldn't be something that, that makes any sense. Um, if you started your own fund, there's no guarantee you're going to manage the same amount. You might manage more. I've seen people leave a pod shop and they start out with three times what they were managing at the pod shop. And sometimes you start off with less because, again, you're, maybe you don't hire the right people. Maybe you're not a marketing guru. You're a trader, right? And they don't know, like, if you're a new investor in this pod shop called Ash Capital, you don't know if that pod shop's going to do well. You don't know if Ash made all his money because he was working at one of those four pod shops, which I'll list over here. Um, you know, so there's no no telling which, what kind of assets you're going to end up with. There's also the annual return. Well, this is sort of a problem at either place. I would argue that it's worse on your own than it is working at one of these places. One of these places might forgive you if you've been a good long-term winner, but your new investors probably won't forgive you. Although you might be able to get a three-year lockup or something like that. So assume your return is going to stay the same. Now, what's interesting is that in a hedge fund, at your own hedge fund, you are going to make, you know, uh, your profit share is going to be higher. You're going to have 20%. The problem is in here where you might have higher team expenses. So you might have to eat like quite a bit, at least five million a year, possibly in expenses and possibly as much as another, you know, I don't know, 20 or 30%. Um, so you might end up making quite a bit less. You might end up making quite a bit more. You're making kind of like a big bet on yourself. Whereas at the pod shop, you're pretty comfortable and you could focus on one thing in one thing only, which is returns. Um, but having your own hedge fund, it's, it's a totally different ball game. So that's kind of, why some people stay at these pod shops and they don't go start their own firms. Uh, they could be worried that that's not going to be received well.
they could be worried uh, about a lot of different things. So uh, at these pot shops, you'd, you, you'd be surprised at how many people have as good or better track records than someone like a uh, Burry. Um, and there are several of those people on this list who left their pot shop. So anytime you see somebody who left a pot shop, that, that's typically somebody who had a very good track record. Now, interestingly, one of the people that left Point 72 that had one of the best track records was Gabe Plotkin, uh, who had the Melvin Capital. And Melvin Capital, uh, unfortunately, had a bit of a disaster when it came to um, the GameStop short, which is well publicized and so forth. But you know, it, it just goes to show you just because you did well at one firm doesn't mean you would do well on your own. Um, and again, I think that person is extremely talented, tremendous investor, but again, the kind of thing that could have been contained maybe at a bigger firm, but wasn't so contained um, within his own firm. Um, so sometimes there's some really good value in staying at the bigger firm because you still have some really experienced colleagues that you know care about your um, success, whereas I think a lot of these when you're on your own, nobody cares about your success other than you, your, your employees, and your limited partners, which will generally let you do whatever you want, whereas you're going to get a little bit of stress testing when you're at a bigger firm, I think. So it could be, could be helpful to stay at one of those bigger firms. Anyway, every, each, each company has its own culture and different environment as well. So, um, But Millennium has a particularly talented group of investors, I think. Um, it's a very rigid firm in a lot of ways, and uh, it's got a lot of rules, it's got a lot of kind of formulaic systems, but they still have an incredibly talented uh, team of, uh, of traders. And again, almost unknown basically, because um, in essence, you know, it's a firm that prizes kind of secrecy and compliance and kind of not, you know, they, I think they be caught dead if they had a bunch of their traders talking about stuff on Twitter, right? All right, so here's D.E. Shaw, one of the most formidable quantitative firms, but they also have some fundamental investors there too. Uh, and again, you know, some really talented people that, you know, um, you'll never hear hear about that have made way more money than Michael Burry or something like that. D.E. Shaw, of course, is where Jeff Bezos, young Jeff Bezos worked. And there's another guy who I've met, uh, Michael Bigger, <laughs> Who, if you don't follow bigger on bigger capital, you know he uh, he was at DE Shaw um, around the same time. At the same time as um, uh, at the same time as uh, um, Jeff Bezos, and so he was an early investor in uh, in Amazon. Isn't that interesting? Um, he's, he's he's a very nice guy as well. I think he became the largest shareholder of Plug Power and Crocs and a bunch of. He just he doesn't have. I don't I don't know that he has any outside capital. I don't remember. I haven't caught up with him in a very long time. But uh, you know, someone to follow. Renaissance, of course, the most famous quantitative hedge fund of all time. Seventy three billion. Unclear how much real assets under management they have. They have sort of two funds. They have Medallion and then they have Reef. Um, they have some other smaller funds too, but that's mainly the sort of two big funds they have. Um, and again, involved in every market in the world. These are just U.S. stocks, U.S. options. They're involved in every currency, every bond, every, every everything. So, Two Sigma, another famous, uh, becoming more and more famous quant fund. They're kind of doing things a little bit differently, I think, from a lot of these other shops. Uh, they're certainly doing their, their, their rapid fire trading, but I think they're also kind of doing a, a little bit more company building type stuff, which is kind of interesting. Um, we'll, we'll see how they go with that. I think, you know, it's an experiment. It could go well. It could go poorly. We don't know. Baliasny, a company that is truly transformed. This was a, and I mean no insult when I say this, this was not a top hedge fund um, for some years, and it has become one. And they should be very proud of, of their success. They built the company, I think, very slowly and methodically. And... Um, they built a really impressive company. You can see actually that they've moved from the eight, number eight spot here to the number seven spot technically. Now this isn't an important metric because uh, this is the SEC filing metric, which is definitely not what AUM is. And it's definitely not what, um, it's something that can often be inflated if you have a lot of options, for example. 
So I think Citadel has a lot of options and their actual net amount, net of all options. Maybe I should probably dedupe that. I wonder if that'd be fun if I just took out all the options using a Python script or something like that. And same thing with Jane Street, right? They don't have 200 billion in capital. They have 200 billion of notional exposure, perhaps. Perhaps, I'm not even sure that's right. But you know that Berkshire has all 300 billion of those assets. I think some of these other firms are actually pretty close to the, the right number, but anyway, that's that's one number to look at. Let's look at point seventy-two, the very famous Stephen Cohen, sometimes called the Michael Jordan of trading, which I would, I would echo that. Uh, he owns the New York Mets over here in New York. Uh, Twenty-nine billion in reported assets. Um, they say going to work at point seventy-two is like going to play for the Yankees. You know, it's one of the best firms you can you can go to play at. Of course, some. Um, there's a lot more to the story, but we'll leave it there. Viking, maybe the most famous so-called tiger cub um, out in Connecticut. Uh, I think the firm almost never had a down year, except for, I think, recently. They had maybe their first down year or something like that. Still a really um, formidable place, probably one of the best um, fundamental investors, period. Right. So Berkshire Hathaway, of course, the best. Some of the people at the pod shops, definitely the best as well. Uh, but then I would put Viking maybe ahead of the pod shops in terms of their stock picking talent. Of course, each pod has its own quality, right? Uh, but Viking is, is definitely one of the, the best. And you can see the portfolio is in thousands and thousands of stocks. It's, it's a handful of stocks that you can look at and say, okay, I like that stock or I don't like that stock. So I'm going to paste the uh, filing there. So if you look at... Uh, their stock list is kind of an interesting place, maybe, maybe to get some stock ideas from. It doesn't mean you should jump in and start looking at it. It just, it's just, uh, you're jumping in and start buying it, God forbid, no. But there could be a list of stocks if you're looking for some new stocks to analyze. That's not the worst place to start if there's some stocks there that you don't know about. Viking, like I said, the best, or uh, the biggest, I should say, Tiger Cub. Uh, maybe not the best, but that's another story. But usually AUM follows the returns. They've had very, very, very good returns under this guy Andreas's uh, stewardship. Now, Bridgewater is probably the biggest hedge fund by AUM. And again, I'll, I'll maybe go in someday, uh, talk about how you can look up AUM. It's not exactly easy. I talked with somebody on Millennium's board of directors who said um, AUM is just a moving target. There are so many definitions of it. This is just kind of equity exposure and you can see that Bridgewater is 18 billion, but that makes sense because they're not really an equity shop, right? They're a macro shop. So they trade things like bonds and currencies and commodities, not things like stocks. So the fact that they have any equity exposure is surprising. And you can see they have just a tiny bit, just the tiny bit they have makes them the 11th largest fund according to this metric. And this, again, this metric isn't perfect. So Baker Brothers, this is a fund that I know well. Um, it's one of the premier biopharma investors. Um, two brothers, Julian Felix Baker, done amazingly well. Um, they are not a hedge fund, so they don't short as far as I know. I'm pretty sure that's right. And they still have $16 billion. And I think they still charge hedge fund fees. So to me, they belong in the hedge fund list, even if they're not um, a hedge fund proper. And so $16 billion in capital, all in biotech. And I don't think any of that is options. So you can see when we look at their list, it's kind of got an amazing uh, concentration. And this is kind of what I think the average individual investor is really looking for, is just a handful of stocks. And you can see their list of stocks is maybe even shorter than Vikings. It's a really small list, and you can see it's a really chunky list. Like they have a quarter billion in this one stock, Acadia, which I've been short over the years, and I think still think it's short. It hasn't worked that well for them. But they have a quarter billion or three quarters of a billion in half a billion, whatever, in Ascendus. And look at this, they have $2.5 billion in Beijing. And that's after, I think, they sold some. $2.5 billion in one stock. Is that their biggest stock? No, they have $3 billion in Insight. They were really early in Insight. So they'll hold stocks for 10 years if they have to or want to. And they're usually on the board of, of some of these stocks. They have $6 billion in CGen, and it looks like they're about to sell the company to Pfizer. Um, so Baker Brothers, $6 billion in CGen. They practically run CGen. And a lot of people don't get that. When you own that much of that stock, you're in control. If you want the CEO fired, he's fired. If you want uh, somebody promoted, they're promoted. If you want somebody on the board, they're on the board. 
that's kind of the you know basic way that happens. So you can see they have six billion in one stock, and look at all these little stocks they have: five million in this, ten million in that, twenty million in that. I wouldn't even look at these stocks. Imagine running this fund. Like these aren't interesting or important to you. The only ones you care about are maybe the ones over over hundred million at least. So if you look at that, they really only have like 10, 15 stocks. So I think that's that's it's really interesting, right? Half their portfolio practically is in is in CGen. And part of the reason it's in CGen is because it's gone up so much, right? So it's total 15 billion. They are the biggest biopharma player, uh, arguably by far. Um, so let's leave that there. Now we're gonna talk about a very controversial name, Tiger Global. <laughs> So Tiger Global was kind of the restart, if you will, to some extent, not really, of Tiger. Julian Robertson, rest in peace, just passed away, one of the godfathers of hedge funds. So Tiger Global was called Tiger Tech uh, a while back. And uh, the fund manager, Chase Coleman, has had one of the best track records in hedge fund history um, until the last couple of years where, um, I guess, the exposure, the beta, all of the stuff sort of came, came home and the fund had a very bad year. And it's, so it's had a bit of a bad run, but I would never count Chase out. I think that um, they'll make a comeback. They'll be successful. Um, they have been successful for so long. They'll make their comeback. They know software. They know tech better than anyone. Uh, I would definitely look at their portfolio for potential you know, stocks to analyze. Not stocks to just buy, but stocks to analyze. Um, you know, Just because Tiger owns it or I own it or somebody else owns it doesn't make it a good stock. You know, half the stocks in this portfolio, or at least a quarter of them, maybe a third, maybe even half, will underperform. You know, so keep that in mind. I really want to emphasize that. Why am I looking at this? Well, somebody asked me about Michael Burry, and I got off on this tangent about how there's at least 100, at least 100 investors on Wall Street that are more interesting and more profitable than Burry. And I just want to point out a couple of places they work at, and then there's places that aren't on my hedge fund list, which you can find on my GitHub github.com forward slash martin shkreli forward slash models. There's a lot of investors out there that you've never heard of. They don't file 13 Fs at all. Uh, they're offshore. Uh, they don't handle US money or any money for that matter of anybody else's. Uh, there's some under the radar quant funds. A really good example is, uh, this is a really, uh, really, really funny example. This was, uh, and they tried to hide this quite a bit. And this article blew the cover off. This is the one good thing Bloomberg Media has ever done. It's called the $13 billion Angels. Yeah, basically in 1997, these guys, some somebody started donating uh, millions and then billions of dollars to the Huntington's Disease Foundation. Nobody knew who it was. It was this crazy, you know, really weird thing. This fund is the fund that did it. Um, this guy, David Gelbaum, is probably one of the most famous things in quantitative investing, and you've never heard of him. He's made way more money than Michael Burry. Ten times more money. A hundred times more money, probably. Um, and you've never heard of this company, this firm. He doesn't have a Twitter account. In fact, they had no website whatsoever. And this guy donated billions of dollars to... The Huntington's Disease Foundation, again, where I, where I had, I hired a, a very senior uh, researcher from. And uh, it's basically this quiet quant fund that just makes a fortune every year, very similar to Renaissance or something like that. And for whatever reason, the people just donate all their money. Um, and, and some Bloomberg gumshoe reporter, we all know how spicy those Bloomberg reporters can be. This reporter found out they wanted to know who's funding this Huntington's Disease Foundation. And unfortunately, this guy's generosity came back to not haunt him, but came back to de-anonymize him. So they were able to uh, discover that it was these guys that made those donations. So those people, uh, the Bloomberg people, were able to sort of like out this person who wanted to be private. They outed... Uh, these people as the donors and there's basically the largest donation ever made to a, like a medical charity over the course of many, many years. So through that, they started pulling on the thread of, okay, well, who is 
TGS. And where does that come from? And they pulled out all these layers and entities and they discovered what, who this firm was. Um, so in any event, um, that's kind of what happened there. But the point is, uh, there are people who have made better calls than Michael Burry, better, more, more profits, et cetera. And this is a global game, right? So there's people in Asia, in countries that you'd be very surprised uh, where there's some very good traders. So don't, don't uh, sleep on uh, other investors. Uh, and again, if you're going to fanboy uh, an investor, uh, certainly be very careful. Don't follow what they do. Uh, don't copy their portfolio with your own, you know, blind picks of their portfolio. You can't see their whole portfolio, right? Uh, you can't see their shorts. You can't see their bonds. You can't see their, their uh, oftentimes their swaps. You can't see uh, their convertible bonds. Sometimes they don't report those. You know, there's a lot of stuff you just can't see. You certainly can't see their shorts or their index instruments. So futures, for example. So if you had a fund that, <laughs> I'll give you an example. If you had a fund, this is hotshot fund. It's called actually, let's call it, uh, let's call it simp, simp asset management. And you're following simps PM on Twitter. You see all his tweets. You really love simp and you become a simp. And Simp Asset Management is your favorite hedge fund. And you go into their 13F and you see they have their long one stock, SIMP. And that's it. Their AUM is 5 billion and they have 1 billion in Simp. What's wrong with this picture? You, you go into your Robinhood and you buy $10,000 of Simp. Well, I think you just made a big mistake. Why? Well, you don't know what the rest of SIMP is all about. In fact, you 13Fs don't require them to show all their positions, but they could very well be short. You don't see this. They're short $10 billion of SP. Well, let's say they're short $10 billion of ES1. This is the E-mini future. Well, you don't have to report futures on 13Fs. So you don't know that they're actually just short the market with all their capital. And they're really good macro traders. So they're long simp because, I don't know, the guy's brother works there or something. But they really think the market's going to collapse. So they're actually happy when simp goes down. They want simp and every other stock to go down. So when simp goes down and your $10,000 becomes $3,000, and simp has is, is, had the best year in its history, you know, you feel kind of stupid. You know, don't, don't just trust these 13 Fs. I mean, obviously the company is long the stock, but they could be sold out of it next week. You don't know. And it could be at a firm like this, again, a lot of smart people at this company, but every office has an idiot, right? And it's not always obvious who that idiot is. And that could be the one stock that that idiot really likes. Out of 10 traders at that company, one of them's bad. And they just don't know it yet. And they'll be fired next year or the year after. But in the meantime, they're going to lose a bunch of money in one of these stocks. Don't be the guy that buys the stock. And you don't know who at that firm, not every stock at, at 0.72 is personally sanctioned by Steve Cohen. Not every stock at Citadel is personally sanctioned by, by Ken Griffin. In fact, almost none of them are. They're just betting on these betters. And the betters could be wrong or could be right. I know a guy that went to 0.72 and he was fired within three months for making bad bets. Could you imagine copying his trades in 0.72's filings? And then there's guys at 0.72 that are almost always right, but you can't tell from the 13F which is which. So 13Fs are, are a big waste of time, but I'm only pointing them out because one, people are very interested in them, looking at things like this file, these lead tables. Uh, this is one fund, Lone Pine, that I admired quite a lot, but it's kind of fallen from grace. It used to have the Midas touch. It used to never be wrong. And they've just had a very, I wouldn't say poor, but, but they haven't had performance like their old selves in a long time. And that's something that's, that's really interesting, right? This is my favorite hedge fund for so long, and it's just kind of been kind of meh. Um, these guys were in Google early. They were the best hedge funds ever. And it's just sort of not been that great. Um, it hasn't been bad, but it's not been the legendary performance that they used to have. So again, just not a good idea to follow these too closely. If you're in the hedge fund game, it's a bit different, right? You know a lot of people at these firms uh, and you're interested in, in that for that reason. But if you're you know, just uh, Joe Blow, yeah, this is a waste of time. Now, here I have listed 150 hedge funds. I haven't even gotten around to linking all the filings and sorting them and this and that. It's just not a good use of my time. But 
you can still get that file um, on my GitHub if you'd, if you'd like. So let's get back to reality, maybe.